It was that little girl sitting down there that I ended up marrying, which I never thought at that stage would have happened either. I remember Merv saying to me, because um, she worked at the Māori Affairs down here in the bottom of Bank Street there, and uh, Merv used to often accuse me of having a Māori affair. Um, and <laughs> I'll get my own back one day, so that's nice. I wonder if, um, and I feel, I, feel, I feel inspired to do this, i totally out of plan. I wonder if um, Malcolm, not Malcolm, sorry, Gary and Marianne would come out here. Would you, would you like to come out here? You guys, come out here. Saying it's the um, minister's um, encouragement time, I, I thought I'd like to bring you guys out and have a little prayer with you guys. Really, you've done a great job here, and I hear some very good reports. And um, no, in, in ministry, as I well know, you don't do ministry without your wife being totally involved and committed as well. It's a total commitment for both of them. Let's just kneel, shall we? Father in heaven, it's um, just so good this morning, Lord, to, to be here, and especially as this is the uh, Minister's Encouragement Day, Lord. Um, I just want to pray for these guys, Father, and um, yeah, it, it, it's not easy for a person to come in without the training that, uh, that we sometimes have. It's probably sometimes a hindrance, but however, it's great that these guys have taken this call, Lord, mm. and we know that you've blessed them, mm. and uh, we, we just pray you'll continue to guide their ministry here and that your spirit will be poured out abundantly upon both of them, Lord. And we don't know what's going to happen next year. It's in your hands. And so we, we just pray that in the meantime, Father, you'll continue your blessing here and that you'll be a, a, a guide and a help and assist these guys in their ministry they do for you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Yeah. God bless you, man. Yeah. That's the mic. <laughs> God bless you. Yeah, good. Oh, I've got my uh, little control here in my pocket. Uh, yeah, um, spring is here. It's nice, isn't it? I, I, I love the feel about spring. We're up in Kaikoui Church the other week. It was two weeks ago. And they announced there about daylight saving coming in. And I turned to Susanna and I said, it's only just gone out. <laughs> Where does the year go? And uh, yeah, spring is a wonderful time. You know, I'm out the paddock now in our place. It always still inspires me and... You guys will not feel probably the same joy, but the thrill of above calf being born. Isn't it wonderful? You know, and just out our window, that happened just the other day, and we were watching it, and the, the cow immediately runs straight to the, to the head of the calf and licks the afterbirth off so it can breathe, and the little thing gets up in a few moments so quickly, drinks from its mother, and then you see it tearing around the paddock in new life. It's a great sight. The flowers are coming out, and it's interesting seeing the trees because... Some trees, like the magnolia, as soon as the first little hint of spring comes, they burst out in flower, don't they? Others are more cautious and they wait till all the frosts are over and then they start to come out. Like we've got an a, um, a, a umbrella um, thingy bob tree there and it still hasn't come out yet. It always lasts to come out after, in spring. Yeah, so, so spring is here. And I thought, um, talking about spring, what is something that you think of when you think of spring? comes to your mind? Daffodils, yes, yes, yes. I, I, I think spring is a time for gardening, you know, and uh, I, have, I have two, two implements at home and I meant to bring them here this morning but in our rush we forgot. I got a neat little fork and a push hoe. You know what they call push hoes in Australia? I don't call them push hoes over there. You know what they call them? Anybody like to have a guess? They call them Dutch hoes, a Dutch hoe. Any, anybody heard it by that name, a Dutch hoe? Okay, some of you know that. Can anybody tell me why they call it a Dutch hoe? The only reason I've worked out is that it looks a bit like a Dutch hat. You know, the girls in clogs wear I thought that must be the reason why it got the name Dutch hoe. But, you know, they, they, I, I really enjoyed gardening, and I sprayed off the other week, and I'm already now to start tomorrow to do the planting. Gardening, I find, is so therapeutic and a time for sowing seeds. And so our, our scripture reading this morning was about a farmer who was, who was um, sowing seed. And uh, it, Jesus gave it a spiritual application. He, he showed from this passage that the, there is a parallel between the germination of seed in the soil and of the work of the Spirit in our lives. And that's the point that Jesus was wanting to make uh, out of this parable. First of all, the, the historical setting at this time was rather fascinating because... 
Israel at this time was occupied by the forces in uh, Rome. Rome was occupying Palestine, it was called. Now, I don't know how you would feel, but I sort of feel for the Jews a little bit on this one because imagine what it would like for us if we were occupied by the Taliban. How would we feel? If they had occupied and we had to pay taxes to them, and I know that we would be very, very desperate to gain our independence, the same as the Jews were desperate. So these were very difficult times. And Jesus seemed to be a likely leader. I mean, you, you just look at the possibilities of this guy from a Jewish perspective at this time. I mean, he could feed 5,000 people with five loaves and two fishes. And one of the, the, the greatest problems with an army, moving an army, is to feed them adequately. That's why in Old Testament times, whenever an army came against Israel, it usually wasn't against Israel, the three superpowers of the day were Babylon in the east, Assyria in the north, and Egypt in the south. They were the main superpowers, and that's where the main battles were going, and poor little Israel was stuck in the middle, because they didn't come, if Babylon was coming to attack Egypt, it wouldn't come directly from the, from the east because of the Arabian desert. They'd have to carry all their food. Logistics were impossible. So what they would do, they would follow the Fertile Crescent up. They'd go up the Euphrates River. It was people lived there and they grew their crops there and they'd plunder the crops as they went and they had the food supply as they went. And they'd cut across and come down the Jordan Valley and plunder again. So there was a ready market for food. It was always a problem. But here was a leader who could feed an army with five loaves and two fishes. Wow! This is the guy we want. Also, he could heal the sick. Did you know that in wartime, there are more people that are killed and more people die because of sickness and disease than are killed by the enemy? And I was up in Papua New Guinea there. I was up in the Kokoda Trail. You probably remember the Kokoda Trail. It's a trail that goes across from Port Moresby over to now Popandera. It was called Buna at the times of the war. And there was a book written about the Allies and their trekking across we're a little village called um, Afogi, which is right in the middle of the Kokoda Trail. And I did quite a bit of a walk along there. An amazing place. And these troops had to make their way across from Port Moresby over the Owen Stanley Range, the Kokoda Trail, and into Popandeta, where the Japanese were settled and fixed in that position. And they were to drive them out. And the story that you read is a tragic story. It wasn't the enemy that killed him, it was the malaria, dengue fever, and diarrhea. They record how the diarrhea was so bad that the soldiers cut the backside out of their pants so they could walk in a little bit of comfort. It was a dream, and they, 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 they dropped on the way like flies. Tragic story. But here was a leader who could, if a person got sick and died, he could just put his hand out and say, arise and walk and be well. Wow, what a leader like that. There's great potential in this guy. Because you see, the, the, the Jews were, were longing for the days of David and Solomon, those glory days. You know, like the Kiwis are longing for the days again when the All Blacks would go out and win the Bledisloe Cup and win the Tri-Nation series without hardly trying. It was just a set thing, you see. Or the days of the Hadleys and the Cricket and the Crow Brothers and Jeremy Coney, those days. We look upon it with fond memories of a distant memory of the past. It's gone. Israel was in the same position. They were looking back on those days with a fond memory of wanting to begin. And here was one who maybe can achieve it for us. Why? He could even raise the dead, this guy. You know, you imagine if you're out in battle and you're fighting and you get shot and you fall down dead and Jesus comes along and goes, arise and walk and wow, you pick up your weapons and away you go again. An army like that could never lose. And so they were looking for this likely leader. But Jesus had a different story and he, he didn't um, uh, uh, go along with their, their views. Are we working here? Oh, next one anyway. Yeah, yeah, there it is. Jesus didn't dance to their tune, and they didn't like it. He was demonstrating that his kingdom was not based upon a revolution, a coup, a coup or by force. His kingdom was based upon the principles 
and changing people's hearts, which was his Sermon on the Mount. That's why he said things like, blessed are the poor in spirit. That was so contrary to Jewish thinking at the time. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. That's not what they wanted to hear. Blessed are the poor in spirit, and so he went on. And these were the principles that Jesus was trying to establish. And that's why there was great controversy at the time over Jesus' leadership. So he brings up this parable about the sowing of the seed. And he's down there by the lake and there's a huge crowd gathering around. And so Jesus decides he'll get a vantage point and hop in a boat. So he hops in a boat. I don't know whose boat it was. Maybe it was Peter's. One of the fishermen around. doesn't say. And he hopped in a boat and I sort of have a a mental picture of him hopping in the boat, you know, and the wind, offshore breeze is blowing and Jesus standing on the boat and slowly he drifts further and further away and he gets smaller and smaller and he gradually, his voice gets quieter and quieter and he disappears. No, it wasn't like that at all. It's only my imagination. But Jesus stood on the boat there and as he's speaking, he's wondering what he's going to talk about to the people. And so he notices on the hills, which if you've been to that area, you can see the hills there in the distance, he saw a farmer sowing seed. And he thought, there's my sermon. I'm going to give that sermon about the seed. And so he told the story. And he got up and he said, the farmer went out and sowed seed. And some of the seed fell on the path. Some of the seed fell amongst the rocks. And some fell amongst the weeds. And some fell on the good soil. And that was the end of his sermon. I can go and sit down now. That's it. What would you say? Some of you would say, well, great sermon. That's all we need to hear. Fantastic. Others would say, you've shortchanged us today, Samuel. But that was his sermon. And after it was all over, the disciples came to him and said, Lord, why ever on earth do you talk in parables? Why do you do that? You know what Jesus said? I love what he said. It's coming. He said, because you're thick. I mean, you're looking at the Bible, you're shaking your head, it doesn't say that in the Bible. Well, that's true. It doesn't say that in the Bible. But it means the same. They were set in concrete. That's why he talked in parables. You know, I have a, I have a second girlfriend. Suzanne knows about it, so it's okay. I can tell you about it. I have a second, a second woman in my life. She sits at our front door, and in her arms she holds a big vessel, like in Bible times. And she's partly naked. And she's very attractive. But you know the problem is? She's got a heart of stone. She's made of concrete. And this was the same with these people. Their, their heart was hardened and a heart of stone. And Jesus said, I need to talk in parables so that those who are, are with me. And so can follow what I'm saying. The contextual situation is so important for us to see this as we lead up to the story because I, I have a great belief at the moment that when we're interpreting the Bible, we should look at the context very closely to see who Jesus is talking about. Now, I, I'm going to put a little bit of my own interpretation, which is allowable because when you have your turn to come up here, you can do the same from your perspective. So I'm going to give my perspective. But it's very important for us to nail down the context, what is happening here. It starts back in chapter 11. Jesus goes on an itinerant missionary trip. He's trained the disciples, and now he's ready, and away they go. And on their itinerant trip, they are walking through a field of, of grain, and it's a Sabbath. And they must have started fairly early because it says that the disciples were famished with hunger. And as they walk, they reached and began to pluck some of the ears of corn and the stuff that was growing there, and they rubbed it in their hands, and they began to eat. I, have you ever eaten wheat that's just straight off the... It's rather nice. It's a bit hard on the teeth, but it's rather nice. And so they were chewing on the wheat. And the religious leaders came on and said, ah, ha, 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 you guys are breaking the Sabbath, harvesting the grain. I used to hear that a bit when I was a youngster too. And uh, so they kept on going, and then they came to the synagogue. And when they went into the synagogue, there was a miracle, not the first miracle that Jesus performed, but it was the first one on this day. 
There was a man there with a withered arm, withered hand. And the same Jewish leaders said to Jesus, is it lawful to heal this guy? Now I love what Jesus said. Jesus turned to them and said, if you have a sheep and it's caught in a pit, what will you do? You'll go and rescue it. Is not this man worth more than an animal, a sheep? There's an important lesson there too, and this is just a little, little side thing I want to sneak in here. Notice Jesus said that human beings are more important than animals. I, I see today some people treat their animals, cats and dogs, more important than human beings. They have more rights sometimes. Jesus made it clear that human beings are more important. I've got, I've got a cat and I had a dog, and I love my cat, but I don't compare it to human beings. And I certainly don't kiss it goodnight, or even let it sleep on my bed, or even let it sleep inside. <laughs> but I love my animals. And then Jesus healed the man. And you know, what the, you know what the Pharisees and the Jews started to do, the, the religious people they do? They started to plot to take God's, Jesus' life. Because he healed this man. And what's more, he did it on Sabbath. And what's more, he did it in the church. How terrible can you be? And then they went on and Jesus walked out. He was so, so disgusted, he walked out. And uh, the, the next thing we find him doing that he's... Uh, the crowd follows him out, and he has this huge crowd following along behind him. And, um, yeah, can you change it? This huge crowd following along behind him, and you know what it says? Jesus healed them all. Wouldn't it have been great to have been there on that day? Oh, I tell you what, you know, when you get, uh, some of you around my vintage, when you start to get to my age, you, you start to feel a few pains and aches. I was up on the roof the other day, and the wind came up and blew my ladder away. And I was in a bit of a desperate situation. I was stuck up on the roof. The neighbours were out. And I was stuck up there and couldn't get down. So I used my army training days. And I remember very clearly, you know, you find the lowest point And then you hang on. And you lower yourself down as low as you can go and drop. And when you hit, you bend your knees quickly. I tell you what, it bounced me around a bit at this age. It wouldn't have been lovely to have been there and Jesus could touch our knees and, and touch our backs and whatever, and we were healed. Wow, he healed them all, it says. Healed them all. And then that started another controversy uh, with, the, uh, with the Jews. And then it, the third miracle took place uh, where it was, this man had a, a triple handicap, the trinity of handicaps. It says he was blind, he was dumb, and he was demonic. I was talking to Susanna about this and she said, you know what, he probably had a congenital problem called, called, called Usher's, Usher's syndrome, where they, they are born deaf, and that's probably why he was dumb, he was deaf, he was born deaf, and they go blind after a while as well. And he was acting in a demonic state. So this guy was pretty bad. Now they were outside and he came up to Jesus and Jesus reached out and healed him. Amazing. And then there was another big argument. The Pharisees and the religious leaders came to Jesus and they said, you healed him by the power of Satan. And I love Jesus' reply. Jesus was, Jesus was quick-witted and he was smart off the mark and he knew exactly what to say. You know what he said? And I thought his argument couldn't be beaten. Beautiful argument. He said, that's very strange. He said, if, if I heal by the power of Satan and by Satan's power cast out Satan... Isn't that stupid? How can a kingdom stand if it's casting itself out all the time? Good point, wasn't it? Boy, the logic in that you couldn't argue with. And then they started accusing Jesus of all sorts of horrible things, which is to, to, accu to, to, to accredit the work of God to the work of the devil leads to the unpardonable sin. Did you know that? That's what it was saying there in that passage. And... Then it was that, um, we can get another, yeah. then, it, then it was another heated discussion with the religious Pharisees. And you know what they said after that? I love this part. You can see it up there in verses 38 to 42. They asked Jesus for a sign. Do you see why I say that Jesus said they were thick? 
I mean, he'd performed all his miracles. He'd done wonderful things. He'd taken a man who was blind, dumb, and demonic and healed him. They've done it before their very eyes. And they say, well, give us a sign. It's incredible. And then it says, and this is where our story comes in now, and then it says the very next thing it says after that is that that same day, and now we're back to, to where our, our, our scripture reading started from today, that same day, and this is what was happening. Jesus then tells the story of the, of the sower and the seed. And this is the historical setting. And so he, he starts off the story, um, we're having trouble with this today, aren't we, guys? Thank you. This is really a, a, a good news story, the story of the parable of the sower and the good news of the gospel. And as I said before, I try to be a little bit care in my application because I like to stick close to the word of God. But we sometimes do interpret our perspective of the story and so that will come through as we talk today. Most seed produced fell, produced fruit. Now that's encouraging, isn't it? Let's note that again. Most of the seed produced fruit. It was all different and it didn't matter. Some was 100, some was 40, some, and some was even 30. Most seed produced a harvest. And that to me is very encouraging. The second point is that the soil was the same in each case. The good soil was the same as the soil amongst the weeds and was the same as the soil on the path and was the same as the soil amongst the rocks. It was all the same soil. That's encouraging. This is why I say it's a good news story in many ways. But in three places, the soil became contaminated. The rocks, the path, and the weeds. And we want to see uh, that and how we can overcome some of those difficulties as we go through with a difficulty like this machine is playing out right now. I never had a lot of trouble with remotes, you know. They often give problems like this. Um, what's happening there, guys? Oh, yeah, it's up there, is it? Okay, yeah. So the first one, the path. And it was, the, it was the magpies that caused the problem. It says in the Bible that the birds took the seed away on the path. The birds took it. I say magpies because when we were living in Melbourne, my ga little garden I had in Melbourne, the magpies would sit there and they'd watch me working and planting it. And then as soon as my back was turned, they'd come down and dig the seeds up and eat them. They were cunning little beggars, magpies. I used to love them. There used to be many in our garden. We used to feed them. They were great birds. And so I put boards on the top of the seeds. And they were quite disgusted with that. So when I planted my tomato plants, they came down just to pay me back. And they picked them all out and just picked them out. Didn't eat them, just picked them out of the garden. Couldn't believe it. And so uh, uh, this is what was happening here. The, the magpies were, were eating the, eating the, uh, the seeds uh, and uh, taking them off the garden. Now, uh, Jesus made the point here. What he's saying here is that the whole context was setting in the sense of Religious people, that's the primary meaning was, that it was religious people were represented by the path. They become hardened. And, and as you see the context and the setting that we're looking at and how Jesus had done all these wonderful things and he performed all these great miracles and still they say, give us a miracle, Lord. They become hardened. And I remember somebody telling me once a long time ago, many years ago, that the most dangerous place for people to be as Christians is sometimes in the church. You look at me and say, how can you say that? It's true. Do you know why? Because the same sun that melts the wax hardens the clay. That's a very significant statement. The same sun that melts the wax hardens the clay. You've only got to look into the Muslim world to see how this is so true. We can be very religious, but we can be very hard-hearted as well. And this was represented by the path. And so the danger sometimes is that it can be the religious ones that can become the ground of the path. And as we, we go a little further, we see another thing that I believe. This is where I'm starting to interpret it now because up to that point, that's exactly what Jesus was talking about. But now I'm going to make it apply a little bit today as well. I believe also criticism is one of these things that is the pathway. One of the birds that's taking away the truth. Criticism. I'm not talking about the criticism where you go home and say, oh, you should have seen old Samuel today. He had real trouble with the remote. It was really weird. I'm not saying that sort of criticism. I'm talking about the criticism that maligns people's character. That sort of criticism. It's one of the birds that takes away the seed of God's truth. Then there is the, the third one, is that sometimes soil is hardened by others walking upon it. 
the soil is hardened by the pathway of others. I remember at the Victorian camp, we were just about ready to start camp, it was the day before, and I was just making a few adjustments in the big tent. They had two big tents over there, one for the contemporary service people and one for the more traditional service. They're two big tents. It was a big camp, Victorian camp. And this family arrived from way out country, you know, it was a long way out, and coming to Melbourne for them was, was wow. I, I remember as a kid going to Auckland, you know, we'd drive down to Auckland to go to camp. We're going to Auckland, you know, it was like the end of the world. Auckland, this big city. And these little kids were like that. They were going to Melbourne. This was a big day. And they came running into the tent. They just arrived. They came running into the tent, these little kids. Another minister in there, who I'm ashamed to say was a minister, turned on these kids and dressed them down something hard. You don't run around. This is God's house during this camp meeting. And you don't run around inside God's house. For goodness sake, we were still setting up. And they were fascinated by all this stuff in the tent. Continually doing that with young children hardens the path. Do you know what I'm saying? By others. I remember our head deacon at Warburton. He was a very good deacon, excellent deacon. And there were some little kids. We had a lot of concrete around the church. And sometimes the kids from the neighborhood like to come and ride little bikes and play in the churchyard. I used to get to chat because I had an office there at the church. And I think it's good for ministers to have their office at the church, actually. It really is good. I used to do that. And these, these little kids, I used to go and chat to them and talk to them. And one day, when I was there in the office, I heard the deacon yelling at somebody. And I just had a peep out the window. And he was talking to these kids. And I'll tell you what, he was so rough with those kids, he even swore at them because they answered me back. He swore at them. And what do you think those kids think of the Adventist church? See what I'm saying? The path is hardened by others walking upon it. I remember we had a member down there at Warburton who, who had a few issues in life. And one day he talked to me about it and he, he broke down. He was so Probably it was the first time he'd ever told anybody. He was in the Warunga Church in Sydney, grew up as a little boy. And he used to love the PA work at the back, up on the balcony, the big church. And he used to love to fiddle around with the, with, with the guy who, who looked after the controls. And he says, do you know that for a long period of time, sitting there with that man, he was sexually abusing me at the back there during church? The ground has been hardened by others walking across it sometimes. Then we find that the, uh, the, the next um, point is that the stony place is a lack of water. If you look at, at John, John 6, just quickly, John 6 and verse 66, Jesus made a uh, point here, and Jesus understood exactly what this was like. John 6 and uh, verse 66, where he says here, For from this time many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. This would be the context what Jesus was actually referring to. People were on fire and they're enthusiastic for Jesus until he said this. And you look back in the, that story, you'll find what happened was, Jesus said, you must eat my body and drink my blood. Otherwise, you have no part with me in the kingdom of heaven. You know what they began to say? They began to say, who does this fellow think he is? He wants us to eat his body and drink his blood. This is stupid. How often do we do that, though, with Jesus, with God, his word? We want to take what is spiritual and make it literal. And often I find it works the other way. We want to take what God says literal and we make a spiritual when it should be literal. You know, there are many people who believe that Jesus said to keep the Sabbath and many people believe that. But, you know, it was symbolic. As long as we have any day, it doesn't matter. See? You know what I'm getting at? 
So often we do that. And, and we, we do the same, though, with prophecy. We look at all sorts of things in prophecy. We see all sorts of weird and wonderful interpretations from the newspapers, from the radio, from the TV. We make all sorts of fanciful stories about it, and we forget what is the most important thing in prophecy is Jesus, for goodness sake. He said, remember, in the book of Revelation, it opens, this is a revelation of the Roman Catholic Church. It doesn't say that. This is a revelation of Jesus Christ. And we need to capture Jesus in the center of everything we do. Because so many people there, they start out, and, and, and we take what Jesus had said spiritually like they did, eat his body. They couldn't work that out. He was speaking spiritually. And we sometimes miss the whole focus of what Jesus is trying to say and what Scripture is about. We miss the point. And this is what was seen by the, the seed that was fell amongst the stony places. And then the, the, the third one, is the, um, the one that fell amongst the weeds. And it said, the cares of this world. That's what the Bible says, the cares of this world. Some of the cares of this world, one of the cares of this world is worry. You know, I've got some very good friends over in Perth that we got to know very well. They went into a business to start a family business together in this recession. They're just talking to me the other night on the phone. has caused them to lose everything trying to survive, to keep the family together of, was it seven, seven in the family? Totally bankrupt, not a cent left, with a huge mortgage. It's so difficult at times like that to put God first in your life, isn't it? The cares and the worries of life. At the same time, though, I love what Mark Twain said. Mark Twain said, I've been through some terrible things in my life some shocking things in my life, most of which never really happened. That is true, isn't it, with worry? It is, but there are some genuine times that we do where you, we get surrounded by worry and surrounded by pressure, and it tends to cloud out the things of God. The other thing that the cares of this world uh, is materialism. Our drive for materialism in the Western world is shocking. I, 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 don't, I don't believe that God wants us to live like people say in Papua New Guinea, though. I don't believe that. God wants us to have a nice things, a nice home. I believe that. But he said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be. That's the key. Where is your treasure? If your whole life, if my whole life is centered upon making money and making things in this world great and beautiful, we miss the point. Letting those weeds choke us out. Another thing that I think is, is, is in this, comes in this category uh, of the weeds is um, the secularization. There is a huge secularization of Christianity in this country at the moment that's been happening, particularly under the previous administration. Uh, and did you know that something that really hit me the other, this week was I was on, doing a bit of searching on the internet and I, I found this article about the, the way the populations are going in the world today, that Europe... The whole of Europe is virtually gone to Muslims. Did you know that? Because of the birth rate. The birth rate's about 1.6. And it's impossible for them to catch up now, whereas the Muslim birth rate is up to 4 and 6%. So they say Europe is virtually gone. Canada is practically there as well, and America's on the same road. You know, are, are, we seeing, are we seeing what's happening in the world? It won't affect my generation. I'll be gone before that happens. But are we seeing what was happening you know, in, the, in those Bible lands where that Christianity first went in Asia Minor, the churches, you know, the seven, the seven churches, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, those churches, the center of Christianity is now all Muslim. Is the same going to happen to the Western world? Interesting observation. Maybe that's one of the signs that Jesus' coming is not too far away. It's amazing. So the cares of this world that can crowd out our, our, our trust and our confidence in God. Worry, oh, I had them there. I didn't realize I had them there. Thank you. We've been through these. Materialism and, uh, and finally secularism. You know, how, how subtle it is. I, 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 um, you know, we, we push the boundaries sometimes so far. I, I remember, you know, when I was a boy at high school and um, Peter Jones, was it Peter Jones? Yeah, Peter Jones was an all black. He played for Northland and he was an all black. And they had a game to play in Eden Park. Some of you remember that game. And he scored a try toward the end of the game and won the game for the All Blacks. And he said on the radio when he was being interviewed, 
he used the word which we use in Papua New Guinea, and I'll use it in pidgin because that will cover it up a little bit and make it a little bit appropriate to say in church. Me bugger up finish. But he used the, used the, didn't use the pidgin version of it, he used the full word. And we were shocked. I remember all us kids at high school, a secular high school, talked about this. Wow, did you hear Peter Jones? He swore on the radio. See how the boundaries have been pushed? Today, I mean, that is just a normal word today. See what I'm saying? And that happens in the church too. We push the boundaries. Secularism is so subtle. So I said, we've got to watch those weeds. Solution. Okay, some of the, the solutions that we can do to the problem is that uh, we'll run through this. We can rotate through the hardened path again, soften it up. All right, we can, we can get a scarecrow. I've got an owl on the top of my roof. I had problems with sparrows. They come and sit on the roof and poop all over the roof and it annoys me no end, especially when we have drinking water from the roof. I've now got my drinking water from another source. But I put a big owl up there on the, on, the top of the, on the top of the ridge and he's got these big eyes and he looks around like this. And for a time there were no sparrows. No sparrows. But now they're all back again in full force and they think the, the owl's just a big joke. You can pull out the stones or you can or you can weed the garden, take the weeds out of the garden. All right, and water the garden more, give it more drink to drink. And uh, the, the problem with these is, you see, this, this is how, I, I have to say something, this is how I was brought up as a boy, and, and actually it says in the Bible, we shouldn't pull the weeds out, doesn't it? Let the wheat and the tears grow together. Don't pull the weeds out. And, and this is how often that we were brought up. Now, I do believe that there is a place for this um, in, our, uh, in, in our lives. What's happening out again? Oh, yeah, we can use Roundup or Hitman. It's a pretty good product to, to knock back the weeds. And they have a, a part to play. Uh, or we can convolt, cultivate with a push hoe, which is a very good method of keeping out the weeds. But do you know something? That these do work, and I believe that there is a place for these. There is an appropriate time, but I don't believe this should be our first attack. It's like child smacking. Remember all the fuss over child smacking? And I, I, I agree that we shouldn't smack our kids as a first attack, a first approach. It's an appropriate measure, I believe, but it shouldn't be our first attack, nor should these things necessarily be our first approach. They are appropriate to you. Sometimes we've got to pull the weeds out. Sometimes we've got to water the garden more. I'm not saying that. I don't want you to think that I've gone to a loony left on this one. There is a time for these things. But do you know something that I did a survey in the United States of America and they found out that the largest number of unmarried young girls that are falling pregnant are from the conservative religious states. Did you know that? So what I'm trying to say to you is that these things are appropriate and they're measures we need to use, but they're not the answer. The stones will always keep coming. The scarecrow is always there. The garden will always run out of water. We pull the weeds, they will grow up. We even round up and hit them and they still come back. We cultivate with a pusher, they still come back. The largest number of unmarried girls is from Christian, religious, young people. It's rather sobering, isn't it? The laws do not change people. But there is a better way, and I think Jesus had the solution. Never underestimate the power of a seed, is the first point. I have seen seeds, and you've seen it too, can break up the concrete footpath, can break up roads. I have seen that little seed just absolutely twist and gnarl a paved footpath that is solidly set in concrete. A little seed, a little grass seed, and it will break through. Never underestimate the power of God in a person's life. Never underestimate the power of God. The next one is that Jesus said, abide in me. I am the vine. This is the way. Connecting to Jesus. I remember seeing a film a long time ago of a, a grapevine in northern Italy. And it was a very special type of grape that produced a very special, unique type of wine. I mean, grape juice. And that was very, very special. And one day, a bushfire came through that place. It was in, in autumn when all the leaves were were dying off, but still on the, on the vine. And it went through that grapevine and just wiped it right out. Gone. And the old man and the family gathered around and they tears down their eyes, their, you know, the black faces and so on as they were trying to fight this fire. 
and they realized that that vintage of grape would be gone forever. And they began looking around. One of the younger boys, the younger son, he scraped the, the, the bark of one of the vines and he noticed a little bit of green and he scraped a bit more back and a little bit of life still in that stick. And he pulled out and he brought it to the father and they planted that little stick carefully and nurtured that little stick, the little green shoot on it. And it grew into another vine and uh, from that they were able to reproduce the vineyard once more. Friends, that's the key. Abide in Jesus. The last, the last one is that Oh, we've gone off. Drink of the water that I shall give you, Jesus said, and you'll never thirst again. Drink of him. I remember at Yanchep in West Australia, we, this time last year we were there, and it's a very barren, dry place in the summer. And the wind's blowing from the east, it's hot, and it's not a very comfortable place to be. But there's some beautiful beaches there, beautiful beaches. And there, there was a, we found this pile of rocks, and there was a cave, and the, the guide took us down to this cave that went underneath the ground, way, way down. And there was a, 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 like a big power cable following us along as we went along. And I said to the guide, what's that? You know, the light was very dim. And she said, that's the root of a tree. I said, wow, really? I mean, it went a long way. And then there it was, we found a little stream, just a tiny little stream, and the roots ended there, and it was like a great mat with millions of little hair roots sitting on the water. And I thought, I'm going to find out where that tree is when I go back up. It was a fair way down to the ground. I came back up and I looked around. There over in the distance, I could see one lonely gum tree. Everything else was dead. No life. But this gum tree was flourishing because <laughs> its root went down to that river, that little stream, see? That's what it says. And I tell you what, this is what I do when I'm struggling and I'm going through pressures in life. Sometimes the burdens come up and the weeds want to choke out my experience. I meditate and I think about that tree there in Yanchep. I think about that root in that dry, barren, desert place. Flourishing because its roots go down to the water. Jesus said, drink of me. That's what it says in Colossians. Rooted and grounded in Jesus. I love that book of Colossians because in chapter 3 it says this, which is saying the same theme. It says... Since then, you have been raised with Jesus. Raised with Jesus. Set your heart on things above and not on things below. See the difference? You realize you have been raised with Jesus. You are raised with him. You have been raised. It's, it's done. You have been raised with Jesus. Set your heart on things above and not on things below. Then... When Jesus, you know, notice this next part, then when Jesus, who is your life, <laughs> isn't that beautiful? When Jesus, who is your life, shall appear, you also shall appear with him in glory. What a promise. So I want to, I want to say just uh, in, in rounding off today that whatever your soil, if you're hardened in sin, well, probably most of us, it's the other way around, we're more hardened in religion. Or you've been stomped over by others. Maybe you're even bored. You're dried up and you're happy to settle for mediocrity in your Christian life. Or maybe your spiritual life is being choked by the cares of this life. Remember these promises. Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Come unto me and I will give you rest. And notice that the harvest, this is, this is another encouraging thing about God. Uh, you know, God does not play the game according to our rules. One thing I love about God. See, there was some were 100, some were 60, and it even goes so low as 30%. I got 30% in English when I did my first school C and I failed. Failed the whole of school C. I did much better the next time. But the first time I got 30%. But here God says 30% even. See? We're all different. No two of us are the same. And so whatever the soil, friends, I'm just saying to you, let's, let's have our roots to go down deep into the ground, into that, find that stream under there, and tap into the water of God's spirit. And let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for the, the, the parable of the, of the seed. There are so, so many things we could learn from this Lord and we 
have to confess that sometimes our, our life has become hardened and we're like the past and sometimes we allow the rocks to stay and they cause our plant to shrivel sometimes or the weeds are choking us out, Lord. Lord, but this morning we just want to ask you to help those roots of ours to grow down deep and find your spring and your source of life and water. We ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen.